Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. Dagster offers a new approach to building and running data platforms and data pipelines. It is an open source, cloud native orchestrator for the whole development lifecycle with integrated lineage and observability, a declarative programming model, and best in class testability. Your team can get up and running in minutes thanks to Dagster Cloud, an enterprise class hosted solution that offers serverless and hybrid deployments, enhanced security, and on demand ephemeral test deployments. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Dagster today to get started, and your first 30 days are free. Data lakes are notoriously complex. For data engineers who battle to build and scale high-quality data workflows on the data lake, Starburst powers petabyte-scale SQL analytics fast, at a fraction of the cost of traditional methods, so that you can meet all of your data needs, ranging from AI to data applications to complete analytics. Trusted by teams of all sizes, including Comcast and DoorDash, Starburst is a data lake analytics platform that delivers the adaptability and flexibility a lakehouse ecosystem promises. And Starburst does all of this on an open architecture, with first-class support for Apache Iceberg, Delta Lake, and Hoodie, so you always maintain ownership of your data. Want to see Starburst in action? Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Starburst and get $500 in credits to try Starburst Galaxy today, the easiest and fastest way to get started using Trino. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Yingzhen Wu about the Rising Wave database and the intricacies of building a stream processing engine on S3. So Yingzhen, can you start by introducing yourself? Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. And I'm Yingzhen Wu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Rising Wave Labs. We are building a distributed SQL streaming database. Yeah, as you just mentioned, we're, the database is built on top of S3, so it's kind of uh, like novel cloud native, right? And uh, before, I've been running this startup for three years, and before that, I was at uh, it was Redshift, the data warehouse team. And prior to that, I was at IBM Research Armadon, the place where the database was invented. I also obtained my PhD from National University of Singapore, and I was majoring database systems and uh, and stream processing. So essentially, I've been working on stream processing and databases for over 10 years, 15 years. So yeah, it's great. And do you remember how you first got started working in data and what it is about the space that's been keeping you interested? Well, look, well, I just mentioned that I actually uh, did my PhD in databases systems and the stream processing. So it it was actually kind of natural for me to continue my PhD work, right? Well, when, uh, and I joined the industry and I worked for IBM and then AWS. So, but well, initially when I was just started my PhD, I actually uh, tried to explore some other spaces like machine learning, like, I mean, statistics, like, yeah, computer visions and many others. Well, I just feel that I'm not probably, I'm more interested in building things instead of like doing algorithms. Because right at that time, there was no LLM, right? But there was no such kind of thing called well, the TensorFlow. And uh, it was much, for machine learning, it was more about, okay, thinking of better algorithm. I personally, I, I, I don't really think that I'm a, I'm a kind of guy, like machine learning guy. And um, I really like building some things, systems and that can work. So yeah, that's why I, I, will, I choose to focus on databases and stream processing during my PhD. And after that, well, I, as I just mentioned, I just continue my, continue my journey. I feel that I cannot just, uh, I mean, uh, purely doing research. I really want to apply what I learned into the industry and uh, to build something that key everyone can use. Yeah, that's my story. And that brings us now to what you're building at Rising Wave. And as we mentioned at the open, it's a database engine. It's built for streaming applications. It's built on top of S3. But I'm wondering if you can give a bit more uh, context and color as to what it is that you're building and some of the story behind how it came to be and why you decided that this was a necessary contribution to the ecosystem. Well, Rising Wave uh, is a streaming database and it's a SQL streaming database. So the main idea of Rising Wave is to to make stream processing much easier to use and much much uh, much more cost efficient to use. So that's why. So in terms of the ease of use, we think that I mean conventional stream processing systems were about okay. You have to write Java. You probably have to understand a lot of technical details like checkpoints, like some other things. But what I feel is that, okay, luck, probably people can just use like um, 
you uh to use stream processing with a familiar experience like Postgres experience. And in terms of the cost efficiency, I think, well, I mean, nowadays, well, because of all kinds of reasons, like cut, uh, cutting costs, right? People care a lot about, well, okay, the cost efficiency. And I feel that, okay, especially in stream processing, many people say that, okay, they probably do not really want to have stream processing systems because of the cost. And I feel that, okay, look, in the, in the cloud, we can actually leverage the so-called cloud native architecture to reduce the cost. And that's why we build the writing wave. And that's why we actually adopt the so-called decoupled can compute and the storage architecture to uh to, to power the stream processing engine. So yeah, that's the that's the story of writing wave. But before writing wave, well why I build a writing wave, it's um it was mainly well, as I just mentioned, well before that I was at it was Redshift. Redshift is a data warehouse, and uh, many people know that they probably really want to use Redshift for, say, batch processing, right? Or, uh, or probably store a lot of amount of uh, log data. But when I was in AWS, I feel that okay, actually more and more people are interested in reasonable data. They just probably just want to build some dashboard on top of the uh using the original data or probably to gain some real time insights from the original data. And Redshift was not a system for that kind of like stream processing for 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 streaming data. So that's why I feel that okay, yeah, we probably need to build something new and build something new from scratch, and that's writing wave. And as you mentioned, stream processing has been around for a while. Largely, that has been the domain of very programmatic and code-heavy engines. Uh, in particular, things like Spark and Flink come to mind. There have also been a lot of entries into the market for near real-time database engines. Things like ClickHouse, Druid come to mind for that. Streaming SQL systems have been around for a while. I think one of the most notable ones right now is Materialize. And I'm wondering if you can talk to the specific niche that Rising Wave addresses that is either a subset or superset or where in the Venn diagram of all of those problems, Rising Wave is a uh, particularly well-suited option. Before starting building the company, I saw that, okay, I mean, streaming database or Rising Wave were probably uh, like streaming database were probably a subset of uh, stream processing systems like Flink or, or, or or Spark, right? Because well, for Spark and 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 Flink, they are pretty mature, right? And uh, they actually provide a set of data APIs like Java API, Scala API, Python API, SQL API, right? And people can probably do a anything on top of these systems, right? But over the last three years, I feel that essentially. A streaming database is not a subset of a stream processing system. It's actually a superset. The reason here that okay, stream processing system and uh, essentially streaming databases uh, can actually store data, which makes it quite different from Flink and the Spark, because for Spark and Flink are just computer computation engines, and they do not really store data. So if you want to store data, probably you have to use some data lakes, uh, probably S3, or probably store it, uh, store your data in some data lake format, right? But since Rising Wave has both the stream processing engine as well as the data, as, a, as well as the data storage, people can do not, can, can not just, okay, process your streaming data. They can actually store your streaming data and to build a dashboard, real-time dashboard directly on top of, um, your streaming database. So that's, much more powerful than just a computation engine. Because well, as long as you uh, use a computation engine, you probably have to find your, bring out your own storage, right? You have to have your own storage. So that actually limits the usage of the storage computation engine. But I do feel that, key, I mean, Reading Wave is not trying to cover all the cases, um, all the, all, probably all the functionalities provided by Spark and Flink. Because, well, as I just mentioned, well, Spark and Flink can provide Java API, Scala API, Python API, but Rising Wave doesn't really provide that. Well, it only provides SQL. And, uh, but for well, people use UDF, Python UDF, and, uh, and, and probably Java UDF, Scala UDF, just like uh, how you use Snowflake and Redshift. And you also mentioned ClickHouse and Druid. Well, I think, well, these are definitely great 
systems. I I really like uh, these these systems. But Rising Wave addressed a little bit different problem because well, I mean specifically for ClickArt, well, people use it for as an old lab database, right? So people probably store da data, log data, and then do ad hoc queries using ClickHouse. But ClickHouse is not that great to do stream processing. For example, if you want to extract the real time, not, uh, if you want to extract the insights, real time insights from your data, then I mean, ClickHouse probably can have materialized views, but well, it's not good, that great for handling, let's say, streaming joins, streaming aggregations, or in all kinds of things, right? And if we talk about for the the real time ETL, I mean, ClickHouse also doesn't really send data out to some other systems, right? But the right way we can do that because it's a streaming engine. So yeah, that's that's quite different from the uh between writing way and the clickhouse. Definitely another key difference between writing wave and clickhouse is that okay, clickhouse is more optimized for low latency ad hoc queries. It can definitely handle ad hoc queries efficiently, but writing waves are more optimized for handling the predefined queries, like for your monitoring applications, for your let's say alerting applications, you probably really want to have writing wave. And I do see that okay, there are some other so-called streaming SQL engine or streaming SQL database like Materialize, Arroyo, and um, Time Plus, and some others. But I think for Rising Wave is quite different from these systems because for Rising Wave is a distributed cloud native system, and we actually adopt the so-called the S3 as the as a primary storage architecture, or so-called the coupling and computer and storage architecture. And also we have we provide a full set of um, stream processing functionalities like watermark, like time windering, and many others. So that okay, if People come from the Flink world or probably from the Spark world. They can still use Writing Wave without not without any headache. And the point of S3 being the primary storage layer and being able to decouple compute and storage that has been one of the selling points for a number of other database engines that have been focused on largely data warehouse. Uh, use cases, I'm thinking in particular of things like Snowflake, but also distributed query engines such as Trino and Presto. But most of those, those also aren't thought of in the same context as streaming applications. There's usually two separate environments where your streaming engines are doing your real-time computation, but then if you want to do longitudinal analysis and aggregate analysis over larger volumes of data, then you go to your warehouse engine that has this decoupled storage and compute layer. And I'm curious, what are some of the architectural principles in Rising Wave that allow it to do that separation of compute and storage at the same time as the real-time stream processing uh, and some of the ways to think about Rising Wave in that other context of these maybe lake house or data warehouse ecosystem? Uh, okay, so I think well, these are two different questions. The first one is about well, the architecture like the so-called like, decoupled computer storage. And second thing here that okay, how Rising Wave is, well, I mean, can fit into, let's say, data data lake or lake house or ecosystem, right? So for the first question, I think well, the key thing here that okay, for stream processing, the key challenge here that okay, we actually need to, stream processing is continuous query processing. So it means that okay, we actually need to continuously maintain internal states or intermediate results for the stream processing because well, it's incremental comput computation. And you have to guarantee that your internal states or intermediate results never failed or never get lost. Because well, if, if the intermediate results get lost, you have to recompute from scratch, right? which can be super expensive. So Rising Wave adopts the, and most of the existing stream processing systems like Flink, they actually adopt so-called a coupled computer and storage architecture. Basically, they maintain their internal states in their local machines. The problem, the pros, um, the advantage of this architecture is that, I mean, the, these kind of systems can be super fast. But the problem here is that okay, when it comes into, let's say, failure recovery and elastic scaling, these kind of systems probably will have a hard time. The reason here that, I mean, if the internal states get lost, they actually need to create another machine and ask that machine to load the entire state from your last checkpoint and then get recovered, which can be super slow. 
And uh, I we, we come from some some customers migrating from Flink to to Rising Wave, and they complain that okay, I mean before uh, I mean before using Rising Wave, when using Flink, they actually it will take probably forty minutes or probably an hour to reload their internal states back from that checkpoint to their uh, to their local machine. I mean this kind of use case is uh, I mean forty minutes or one hour is too long for some online applications. But writing wave actually stores the internal states in the remote machine, basically the uh, or the object store, right? S3. So essentially, you can get instant failure recovery because well, I mean, if the machine failed, then it failed, right? Not a big problem because right, it, what it stored is only cache. So we can just reload, or we can just reboot the machine and ask that machine to directly access data from the remote storage object store. So, and that about the failure recovery, and similarly for, for elastic scaling, also we can achieve a dynamic, dynamic second level that, uh, elastic scaling, which is super powerful for the streaming workload because, well, I mean, in, in the streaming workload, streaming workload can fluctuate. Probably uh, uh, in the morning, we probably have a heavy, uh, heavier traffic, but at midnight, probably we don't really need so many machines. And that's why we use so-called decoupled computer storage architecture. And definitely, decoupled computer storage architecture is also also much cheaper than just storing your data in your local machine, right? Because your S3 is much cheaper than your EC2. And if you talk about what the lake house thing, I think writing with um, can definitely fit into the lake house thing, uh, the lake house architecture. The thing here that key, I mean, people actually nowadays would care more more or more about the real time data, and they really want to ingest the data in real time into their lake house. For example, if they have their Kafka data, conventionally what people did is that key, they probably will buffer their uh, real time data in Kafka for let's say seven days before delivering it, uh, before syncing it into data lake. Iceberg or some others, uh, or some other data formats or data for uh, frameworks. But nowadays, people probably don't really want to do that because they really want to do analytics over their both their real time data and historic data. So they actually want to continuously think data from their let's say Kafka to their lake house. So Rising Wave can be the bridge, can be the tool that can help you continuously sync data from your I mean the messaging queues are all upstream systems to downstream systems. And actually another interesting thing I would have probably want to mention is that okay, writing wave itself can be the lake house. The reason here that okay, we actually again writing wave stores data, its own data in S3. So in the future we'll probably will consider using iceberg format to store our, our, our data in S3. So which means that okay, people can just use Presto or some uh, some other uh, Arduino, right? And some or some uh, other execution engines to directly query data in rising stored in rising wave. So rising wave will be the data lake on its own and we'll have an open ecosystem if we store data in the iceberg format. That was gonna be one of my other questions is what is the storage format or what are some of the ways that you think about the storage layer in rising wave and how that how that relates to the streaming and incremental capabilities that you've built into the engine well right now rising wave has its own storage the reason here that and which is a row store is not a column store the reason here that key for stream processing well in many cases we probably really want to do let's say joins aggregations and row store is much more efficient for handling, let's say, streaming joins and the, and the streaming aggregations. And so that's why we use RuleStore. But gradually we find that yes, more and more people use Rising Wave to store, let's say, historic data. Because, well, I mean, as the streaming data comes in, right? And after, uh, as the time evolves, this real-time data will become the historic data. So more and more people leverage Rising Wave to store, I mean, their their their, their older data or their historic data. So actually we have the requirement, customers have the requirement to do more complicated analytics over their historic data using Rising Wave. So that's why we are thinking of introducing the column store. And we are thinking of, but we do not really want to build our own column, but why? Because, well, I mean, 
build, I am not a fan of always building something from scratch, right? I'm always in nowadays where there are so many cool products, right? It's cool data formats and uh, and a cool open source software. So I'm thinking of leveraging something that is open, which can be iceberg. And we are probably there are some other definitely there are some other data formats like uh, like Hoodie, like Dell Lake. But right now we are currently working with the iceberg community on storing data in iceberg format. And if we if we have it done that, then definitely I mean people can just store historic data in writing wave and do efficient query processing using their own system or let's say Trino or Presto or probably just using Rising Wave because Rising Wave also has its own batch engine. And we also definitely gather the iceberg ecosystem for free. That's the that's our goal. Yeah, that brings to mind the ways that people, as you mentioned, are using things like Kafka for buffering a certain time delta of information and then flushing that out to a longer storage format, whether that's in their Snowflake clusters or whether that's in Parquet files. And from what you're saying of using the row store for being able to more easily do efficient joins and processing of the records as they're coming in makes me think that you could also pretty easily have some uh, kind of checkpointing or snapshotting operation where it says, as long as data is older than X time delta, then I'm going to push that out to some async process to convert that from the row store into the column store in the iceberg format so that we can do more longitudinal analysis of this data, but also still be able to get efficient query processing on new data as it arrives and then just have that kind of rewriting process running in the background periodically to ensure that you're always getting the best efficiency of data for the time delta that you're trying to operate over. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We are thinking of like, I mean, we are thinking of periodically compact data from real store to column store and probably compact it to iceberg format or probably some other data formats. That's for sure. And uh, that's essentially everyone is doing that, right? Even for Kafka, like Kafka or probably Red Panda or Pausa, they are also doing the same thing. They also want to compact their, uh, their historical data into iceberg format or probably some other open data format, open data lake format. Digging more into Rising Wave and some of the use cases and ecosystem that you're looking to enable, what are some of the other unique capabilities that the Rising Wave engine provides, given the fact that it is natively using S3 as the storage layer, so you don't have that long time horizon of having to bring that checkpointed data into a separate storage system to then do computation, then push it back and constantly having to do this back and forth. And so some of the ways that the engine enables teams to change the way that they think about the types of operations that they want to do on their data and you know when they have to maybe span two systems versus being able to do it all in one context well i think well uh, in terms of the use cases well in terms of the unique capabilities well writing wave well i think well s3 as the store uh, as the as a primary storage, also called the couple of computer storage, it's more about the tech uh, technology. It's more about the architecture. It doesn't really um. I mean, people when when people using Rising Wave or when people use let's say Snowflake, Redshift, whatever, they actually do not need to know that kid. Okay, look, this system is uh, leverage S3 as a primary storage. But what I feel is that actually streaming database basically bring the database or bring the data storage to stream processing and actually create many more use cases than just the stream processing engine. We'll think about this. What we can do use a stream processing engine like Flink or Spark. Okay, we can do probably real-time ETL, right? Well, everyone knows that okay, probably if I want to do, um, let's say, batch ETL, I probably can use Spark. That's the default option, right? So Spark is a definitely the default option. And then people say that, okay, probably I want to do, do real-time ETL. I probably can use Spark Streaming, right? And if Spark Streaming doesn't really work, then I'll probably I can I can choose Flink. That's all about the, the computation engine. They can do they can uh, they can extract data from one place, do transformations, and then send the data out to some other systems. That's real-time ETL. Rising Wave is a stream processing as a stream processing system can definitely do real-time ETL. But the thing here that, okay, I mean, it's not an entire story. What I feel is that, okay, Rising Wave can do much more than that. So I, I think what we are focusing, uh, in, except for real-time ETL, we are focusing on two use cases. The first one is real-time analytics over Kafka data. So 
the thing here that okay, when uh, conventionally what people do is that okay, I mean if they have Kafka data and then they have some other uh, and then they want to do analytics over Kafka data, right? What they can do, they probably need to bring in uh, let's say a stream processing engine, Spark streaming or probably Flink, do analytics and then and then uh, send the data into a database. Let's say Cassandra, let's say let's say Redis, like Postgres, like or even Oracle, right? So they can do this. Um, but the thing here that key, I mean, database, the Cassandra, or probably Redis, or probably Postgres is a different system than Flink, right? Where these are two different systems. If they really care about the freshness, if they really care about the consistency, they have to determine, okay, how I can integrate these two different systems, right? What if one system failed, but the other one doesn't really fail? And what if, let's say, there are some network issues between these two different systems, right? So what rising wave with a storage, with a, as a database, with a data storage does in this scenario is that it can replace the entire data stack. Well, it does, you don't really need a Flink plus a database. You don't need a Spark plus, a, let's say, a Postgres. It's too complicated. Writing Wave is a database and it can just directly consume data from Kafka, do transformations, and then display the results directly into your dashboard, into your, let's say, Grafana, into your metabase, superset, Tableau, right? Whatever. So that's, that can greatly simplify the architecture. That's about, well, the, I mean, real time analysis over Kafka data. And that's one of the use cases. And another interesting use case is, which I didn't really expect three years ago, was that a key writing wave, writing wave can actually, I mean, as a streaming database, can actually power or boost people's uh, or the user's Postgres experience or database experience, no matter whether it's Postgres or MySQL or Power MongoDB or whatever, right? The thing here that, okay, look, let's just uh, take Postgres as example. Okay, I take Postgres example because I'm a fan of Postgres and uh, definitely MySQL is also great, right? And also Rising Wave also speaks in Postgres language. I mean, it's Postgres compatible, so we actually have better compatibility with Postgres. But anyways, well, I mean, if, po if people have Postgres, they actually, they probably have some, they will probably uh, have some performance issues because, well, probably they want to do materialized views inside of Postgres, right? Or probably they want to do some analytics over po inside of Postgres, right? For this system, well, what, so Postgres is kind of slow in handling continuous incremental, uh, uh, incremental materialized view maintenance. Everyone knows that. And Postgres is also not that good for any queries, right? So what we did is that, what we found is that essentially, People can use Writing Wave as a Postgres booster, which means that the Writing Wave can continuously process consume data from Postgres Bing log, also called a CDC, can consume data, continuously consume data from Postgres Bing log, do real-time computation, I mean the materialized view, build the materialized views, and optionally send data back to Postgres so that people can just query the real-time results inside of Postgres. So that's pretty interesting use cases. Um, and uh, we find that case in this, uh, this you cannot do, do this kind of thing using a stream processing engine. Or if you can, if you do that, then you can make things much more complicated because where well, you have to think about, okay, how I can use, let's say, Flink or Spark to consume CVC and then send to a database or send to a computation engine and do computations and then how to send the data back to Postgres. And Rising Wave is a database itself, so it can create a materialized view. And as a stream person engine, it can continually ingest the data from Postgres and send, the, send data back to Postgres. So that's definitely another very interesting use case we have already seen you know, over the last few years. And I imagine if it's not already available out of the box, it should be fairly trivial to even set up Rising Wave as a target for a foreign data wrapper so that you can actually just use Postgres to query directly against the Rising Wave instance to retrieve the latest output of that materialized view without even having to do the round trip back into the Postgres database. Well, that's definitely an amazing idea. Well, I have to say that we are currently working on that. <laughs> so it's, um yeah, yeah, uh, on, uh, yeah, to be honest, well, we didn't really 
so look, well, I think that uh, I say that okay, we probably can send data back to Postgres, right? Because well, I mean that's because well, people just want to let's say if they want to build an application, they actually just want to interact with one single database. They don't really want to let's say bring a Snowflake or Redshift, bring another database and ask the application to retrieve data from a second database, right? Or second data warehouse or second data system. They just want to use Postgres, interact with Postgres. So we say that okay, probably we can send data optionally we can send data back to Postgres. But what we find is that okay, look, people can actually use a foreign data wrapper to directly access data, writing wave data using Postgres and probably can I mean not just uh, I mean access data probably they can also join writing wave results with uh writing wave data re with a Postgres table, right? Yep. That's definitely something we are currently working on and I believe that we will deliver that in Q1 2024. And so digging deeper now into Rising Wave itself and some of the design and implementation of the system, can you give a bit of an overview about the architectural principles of how you've approached it, some of the specifics of how you've built it, and some of the ways that the overall goals and scope have changed from when you first began working on the project? Well, definitely, uh, it's just, uh, as we have already discussed, well, we use the so-called decoupled computer storage architecture. Okay, definitely there are a lot of uh, advantages, right? But I can tell you something about uh, the limitations. One of the limitations is the uh, is that okay, S3 is super slow. So that, okay, I mean, people have the impression that, okay, if, so yeah, people just have the impression that well, S3 is super slow. But, so that okay, we cannot allow people to frequently access data in S3, right? So what we did is that okay, we actually bring a caching layer. Which is to which is a tunable caching layer because well, I mean you can set the as a user I mean as an advanced user you you can definitely set the I mean the cache size so definitely that's the limitation and we address the limitation using caching system but actually an interesting thing here that okay, when we say that okay, we store data in S3 then people will feel that okay, luck your system should never run into so called OOM problem right auto memory problem because where they think that okay no you store data in S3 so you should never come from auto memory problem but the the fact is that can okay, not the case because well, I mean we still need to use our memory to do computation so every time we run into the auto memory um, problem, then we have to explain to our users why we use so-called S3 as a primary storage, but you still may run into the OOM problem because of the, I mean, you are still doing computation using your memory. And okay, so that's about the limitation of the architecture. But if you ask me about what the, the, let's say, the whether we change something or the, the design principles, whether we change that, I think well, it's more, more about, well, uh, I mean, I used to be an engineer, so I focus a lot about well, the technical details. But over the last three years, I gradually find that, okay, look, well, the, the design principle or the so called, well, the, what is it called, well, the, um, well, look, if you talk about well, the design principle the, so, or goals or scopes of the writing wave, well, I have to say that, okay, initially we feel that, okay, look, Writing wave, uh, what writing wave does is to democratize stream processing, right? To make stream processing more accessible to to uh, to everyone, right? Well, I have to say that we will never change that goal. We still want to democratize stream processing. But what I feel is, is that the thing here that okay, we should not focus on technology. We should not focus on I mean how to make stream processing easier to use. I I, I think that definitely that's pretty important as an engineer. From an engineer perspective, I totally agree that, and we work hard to make things much easier to use. But another thing here that I would, I would like to say is that okay, we are actually pushing hard to advocate for streaming processing's use case. Because from when I talk to people, people are, uh, always say that, okay, probably I don't need streaming data. I don't need stream processing because the stream processing, I don't know where, where to, where, 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 where I can use your system. So, Instead of pitching people about, okay, we are building a better stream present system, nowadays we talk a lot about, okay, you don't need to know that, okay, what a stream present is. You can use writing wave in this scenario, for example, okay, I mean, do SQL, stream, uh, SQL processing over your Kafka data, or probably just boost your Postgres performance. And that's how the, I think it's more about the product messaging, right? Well, how our product messaging chain evolved over the time. But definitely, I, I, I still have faith in stream processing, but I do believe that okay, the, the entire market should think about okay, how we can educate people and how we can 
uh, convince people that the stream processing is not a monster. Stream processing is just, uh, I mean, the, a technology that everyone can use. Another aspect of Rising Wave that gets called out in the documentation is the fact that it is a distributed query engine as well. So you're not limited to single node performance. And I'm wondering what are some of the engineering challenges that you've had to work around between managing the scale out capabilities of the system along with the performance considerations around S3 as the permanent storage and just some of the ways that you think about what are the priorities that you're focusing on and then maybe some of the ways that, you, that the cap theorem comes into play along those, uh, those considerations. Well, there, there are so many questions, but uh, okay, look, well, Rising Wave is a distributed system, but we actually, and people also talk about well, the scale out, right? But I have to say that in others, well, in many cases, we do scale up first. That is, well, I mean, we change to a better machine first. So we try a better machine first, uh, rather than just a scale out, because well, essentially, that's how cloud is different from big data, because well, in big data, in the big data world, the thing here that, okay, I mean, a company has already had a set of machines and they did a uh, com so-called community machine, right? And they need to think about, okay, how I can scale from one node to, let's say, 10 nodes and probably, and then scale from 10 nodes to 100 nodes. But in a cloud, instead of scaling out, we actually have the option of scaling up, which is much more cost efficient because well, you, have, you do not need to, I mean, deal with, let's say, the network, network latency. So we always recommend scale up before recommending scale out. But we still we are still building a distributed engine. The reason here that okay, in most cases, well, the most challenging cases are that okay, when when handling the big state stream processing, let's say joins, aggregations, you will soon run out of memory. So you have to distribute from one machine to several other machines. And and also another thing here that okay, scale, scaling up has also had another limitation, which is that okay, if you want to, let's say, do dynamic scaling based on your streaming workload fluctuation, you actually have to you actually have to probably stop this machine and uh, and migrate the entire states from one machine to another, right? So if we have um if we do scale out, then it can make things much easier because we can just migrate part of the space to the newly boosted machine, right? But, okay, so let's talk about the stream, uh, distributed stream processing. I think the key challenge is not about how we can interact with S3, but how we can handle the data scrutiny. Because, well, I mean, stream processing is more about, more about the real-time data, and the real-time data can definitely screw, right? If you use, let's say, a batch processing system, let's say Snowflake or ClickHouse or, or, Click or Redshift, they can just rebalance, right? Rebalance in batches. But in stream processing, the thing here that okay, you have no idea about how the data screwness look like. You have to adjust the screwness, or you have to adjust the data distribution at the wrong time. So that's much more challenging then yeah uh, the, uh, just a rebalancing a batch uh, your batch data so so we actually made a lot of efforts um in rebalancing streaming data and yeah it's more about well, how we ha handle uh, the shuffling or some other things sorry what's the what's the second question <laughs> Uh, mostly just interested in the engineering challenges that you've had to address in being able to build this real-time processing on top of S3 and being able to do it in a distributed fashion. And then th the last uh, curveball that I threw in there was the question about how the CAP theorem comes into play in, in, in the context of trying to address all of these challenges. Okay, okay, I see, I see. All these, all these things I mentioned was more, it's more about the engineering challenges. But essentially... We actually put a lot of efforts in optimizing the user experience in the local machine, uh, in the local machine use cases. So why we do that? The thing here that what we find is that in in many cases people start from their, I mean, uh, let's say I want to start using Rising Wave. They first check out for well, GitHub and then download Rising Wave in their local environment, which is just probably a laptop, a Mac, right? So we actually reduce the bar, we lower the bar for people to use Rising Wave in their local machine. So we did a lot of optimizations, for example, okay, in uh, in your local machine, you know, let's say the Mac, 
you don't probably def, definitely you don't have access to uh yeah uh s3 or probably hdfs right we actually will uh, will pack everything together into uh, one single binary so that you can just run writing wave in a small machine so that the people will just directly test the writing wave functionality instead of scalability test writing waves functionality in, in their local machine if they feel that okay, luck writing wave is the system i want then they will think about okay whether i can install writing wave in my own cluster using kubernetes because we have, nowadays where everyone use use kubernetes so yeah anyways well <laughs> though writing wave is a distributed system we actually put a lot of efforts in optimizing user experience especially for people to use writing wave in their local machine and another element of that user experience and developer experience that I noticed when I was preparing for this conversation is that when it comes to change data capture, as you referred to earlier, most of the time a system will say, oh yeah, we support CDC as long as you're running Debezium. So that's another at least one system that you're running where you have maybe Kafka with Kafka Connect and Debezium, but you opted to actually build your own CDC processing for Postgres. And I think I said MySQL as well. And I'm wondering what were some of the motivations for engineering that into the rising wave system itself versus deferring to other existing solutions? Well, first of all, I have to say that we definitely love Debezium. Debezium is super powerful, and we actually also use Debezium, that's for sure. And for the, but for the thing here that we are quite different from the, writing wave is quite different from the other stream processing in handling CDC in that we do transaction. We actually do transactional CDC. The thing here that okay, look, if you do CDC, it's probably you, let's say the let's say the Postgres CDC or MySQL CDC. These databases are transactional, so people actually want to um, basically preserve the transactional semantics from these databases, right? But for existing, I mean, uh, stream processing systems, let's say Spark, or I don't know whether Spark can do CDC or uh, I mean Spark streaming, or probably Flink or some others. I mean, they cannot preserve the transactional semantics. So people, I mean, especially in the fintech domain, or some, uh, I mean, the, or probably some other, I mean, transact domains that leverage transactions, they actually cannot accept this. So we actually put a lot of efforts in building so-called transactional CDC to allow writing wave to understand the transaction boundary from the uh, issued from the upstream systems like Postgres and MySQL. And that's how writing wave CDC is more powerful and more actually more popular than the other uh, systems CDC. In terms of the overall workflow of teams who are adopting rising wave, you mentioned that the onboarding path is just somebody downloads it, they play around with it, and then they say, hey, this is really cool. Let me put it in production. Once you've got a rising wave instance deployed and you're starting to build workflows on top of it, I'm wondering what are some of the uh, ways that teams are thinking about how to manage that overall workflow, some of the other elements of the ecosystem that they're bringing to bear or other uh, investments that you and the rest of the Rising Wave team are making to make it be a more natural citizen of the overarching data engineering community. Well, I think what well, it's more about the ecosystem. I think well, two things. Well, one is uh, ease of use, and second one is ecosystem. Ease of use, as just mentioned, I mean, we have to we have to tell people why rising wave fast. I mean, we people will not use your system invest as uh, let's say invest let's say a week or probably a month into your into uh, yeah your system. They probably will just uh, check out your GitHub page for five minutes or probably ten minutes. If they're interested, they will probably dive deeper into it, probably download. And they probably don't even need to, uh, they probably don't really want to download in, you know, I mean, using their Kubernetes, right? Deploy your system in Kubernetes. They just probably really, really want to play around uh, on their laptop. If they feel that, I mean, it's not a suitable use case, uh, it's not a suitable system for them, then they will stop using that. I mean, they probably they will just delete right away from their laptop, right? So we make things much easier to use in their own laptop. And about the ecosystem, I mean, if people so if people want to bring a system into their data stack, they actually care a lot about okay, whether the new system they want to bring in can integrate with their existing data stack. For, that's why we actually build a bunch of, let's say, integrations with both upstream systems and downstream systems. 
I mean, people can, uh, people, some people say that, okay, no, we probably don't need this because we can bring, let's say, we, we, can, we can probably use Kappa Connect, right? But the thing here, like, what we find is that, okay, look, people don't really want to bring an additional system to use your system. They just want to use one single system to address all their problems. That's how people think, right? Well, people don't really want to bring troubles, right? People don't really want to bring complexity. They just want to use one single system that is out of a box and then can fit into a desk deck and then can run. That's the thing. So we actually build a bunch of connectors and direct connectors without Kafka Connect, without any additional systems help. So we just build into, uh, yeah, direct connect to all these well, upstream systems and downstream systems and to make writing with much easier to use and much to make people more comfortable to integrate Rising Wave into their existing data stack. And as you have been working on Rising Wave, working with the community, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen it applied? Well, if you talk about for the innovative, uh, I mean, well, I can give one example, which is like, I, I think it's more about well, an effective way to use Rising Wave. So, in the Rising Wave community, we do see a lot of, let's say, trading firms, banks, like, or probably SaaS companies, tech companies. Definitely, they know what stream processing is. They know, okay, what is, I mean, they need real-time data, and they have real-time data, and they need real-time data processing. But what we find is that, okay, actually, Rising Wave is kind of popular in, in the manufacturing industry. I can give you one example, which is like, to me, well, it's kind of a surprise. I mean, this manufacturing company is one of the world's largest manufacturing that produced, specifically produced the TV main board. So this kind of company will give people the impression that, okay, look, well, these kind of companies are kind of old school and they do not really have modern data stack, right? But they probably are still using some old fashioned data systems. They actually adopted Rising Wave to monitor their production line. Before writing, uh, before introducing writing of it, they have their own factories. Uh, this is a big company, enterprise company, and they have multiple factories across the world. And before introducing writing wave, they actually uh, they need to monitor the production line across the world. Before introducing writing wave, they actually have to make phone calls to the on call per, uh, on, uh, on duty personnel and ask them, okay. Is everything good? Is anything that I can help with? Or probably is there anything wrong? Or probably if we want to handle some emergency issues, every six hours, they make such a phone call. But now things changed. This factory, uh, I mean, this company just introduced, let's say, the writing wave into their data stack. Well, I mean, they can just uh, sit into the, 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 their office. And then they also install the so-called the sensors in their production line so that essentially the sensors can send data send their so-called IoT data, right? IoT data into their, let's say, the, a database installed in their the factory. And the factory will continuously send data back to their office, to back to their writing wave instance. And the writing wave will directly display the dashboard to their yeah, IT person. So that they will know, okay, what happened in my factories across the world and uh, whether there's any emergency issues I, do, I need to deal with. And whether there's any, let's say, uh, the flaws or whether there's any anomalies I need to deal with, right? That's how, yeah, this kind of usage cases really impressed me because, well, it gave me an impression that, uh, yeah, I used to think that, I mean, these kind of factories, oh, it's good. They do not really, they are not interested in new technology. But this kind of use cases really yeah, refreshed my mind. And I do really think that okay, more and more factories and more and more companies will introduce new technology to help them to improve the efficiency as well as saving cost. And in your own experience of working on the Rising Wave engine, contributing to this environment and ecosystem and building a business on top of an open source product, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process? The, all the biggest lessons are learned with now with that we could do not just focus on technology, especially for the first two years. I I believe that's where I spend a lot of efforts in thinking about okay what stream processing is and how we can build a better stream processing system. Definitely, that's pretty important. I used to be an engineer and I really love that. I really love hacking code and I really love learning new technologies. I really love I mean learning how how to reduce the S3 latency. These are cool questions. But the thing here that I I feel that okay better understand users not users that use your product, 
but users that do not use your product. So we need to think about the user journey. I mean, look, when not the user journey of using your product, but user journey of building a data tech stack, right? So let's say, okay, I mean, if I want to create, a, if someone build a new company, the first system they introduce will be Postgres, or probably ORTB database. And second, database, a second system they will probably already introduce is probably a Redshift or probably a Snowflake, right? Or probably an OLAP database, right? But then if you tell them, look, do you need a stream processing? I actually have a better stream processing system that can replace your Flink. They won't buy it because they have no idea about what stream processing is and what Flink is. They only care about their own business, whether you can bring more value to my business. So we need to think more about well, the lessons, the key lessons I learned is that okay, I actually have to think more about the user, user journey and where they are and when riding wave can bring value to their business and when riding wave can be a good fit into their data stack. So that's the biggest challenge, well, the, the biggest lessons I learned over the past three years. And for people who are interested in trying to gain a more up-to-date view of the data that they have, what are the cases where rising wave is the wrong choice? Well, don't really, don't use writing wave to replace your Postgres if you are looking for a transactional database. I mean, writing wave can do, uh, I mean, can, can, can process your transactional CDC, but it doesn't really support read and write transactions. So in this, in this case, it's really better to use Postgres or probably MySQL or probably even Oracle. And second thing here, that case, I mean, writing wave probably is not that great for OLAP and Oracle workloads. And if you want to do, let's say, large scans of your of your base table, probably you will need to have, let's say, uh, Snowflake, Redshift, or probably ClickHouse. But Reading Wave is, um, I mean, can be part of your data stack. Well, I mean, even if you have already had Postgres and the and the and the ClickHouse, because I mean, it brings unique value of stream processing to your data stack. As you continue to build and iterate on the Rising Wave project, build a business around it, what are some of the things you have planned for the near to medium term or any particular projects or problem areas you're excited to dig into? I think well, there are two projects I'm super excited about. The first one is the so-called unified batch and stream processing. So uh, yeah, Rising Wave is a streaming database and its focus is on stream processing. But what we find is that, okay, look, people are also interested in batch processing. I'm not saying that, okay, okay, Riding Wave should directly compete against a Snowflake, Redshift, or whatever. But the thing here that, okay, people actually care a lot about, well, they, I mean, do not just want to process their real-time uh, real data. Sometimes they also want to join their real-time data with their batch data. So we actually need to, uh, need to build a muscle of processing batch data. And also, we have to. We also feel that okay, people, are, uh, as I just mentioned earlier in this podcast, we feel we find that okay, as more and more people store their data in Writing Wave, we actually need to provide tools for them to better process their historic data. So that's why uh, that's another motivation. Yeah, why we need to build the batch processing capability. And then that's one project. And the other project I'm super excited about is that okay, we, we have to be more in the with the so-called uh, the data lake ecosystem. As I just mentioned, well, I mean, so we have integration with Iceberg and we are also looking at other data lakes like Hoodies and the Dell Lake. We feel that okay, in the future, people can just store data no matter where, what system it is, well, they can just store data in S3 and they can wrap the data, they can store data in some open data format so that every other, uh, any other data systems can access the data. So that's why we think that okay, we should be have better integration with data, with, with the data lake ecosystem. Earlier conversation, I also mentioned that okay, we have a project with the Iceberg community called Iceberg Rust. So using that project, we actually help people to better uh, to to directly integrate with their Rust-based project with uh, with Iceberg. These are the two projects I'm super excited about. Are there any other aspects of the Rising Wave project itself, the overall streaming data ecosystem and data lake ecosystem, or the work that you're doing to build a business on top of Rising Wave that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? 
Well, definitely. Uh, well, definitely, I would like to say that okay, we actually, from the business perspective, we have to think about okay, how we can educate people about the stream processing. Because well, I think that okay, right now, stream processing is still kind of a niche, and we not just us, not just the writing wave, but also some other vendors like even Confluent. They actually need to think about okay, how we can better educate people about stream processing. And that's the only thing I probably can think about. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. So I think what well, people are building great technology, but we have to wrap it. We have to wrap the technology in some product that is super easy to use for developers in their local machine, in their own probably laptop. That's the that's a gap I believe that's really, we, we need to think about it and we need to probably fill in. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share the work that you're doing on Rising Wave and helping to bring streaming data processing to a broader audience and making it easier to combine stream processing with analytical use cases. So appreciate all of the time and energy that you and your team are putting into that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Theo. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other shows, podcast.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used, and the Machine Learning Podcast, which helps you go from idea to production with machine learning. Visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.